Hi everybody, Michael Bulbenko here, one of the Fuji guys, and I'm going to be talking to you today about what happens inside your camera, what's going on under the hood when you're shooting video. So a lot of it is similar to shooting still photography, but a lot of it is totally, totally, completely different. And I know a lot of you out there are confused, and I'm going to try to make it simple right now as we talk. You know, you get your camera home and you want to start shooting movies, you want to be a filmmaker, or you just want to make some money on the side, or you want to be a big time director and you start tricking out your camera with all this stuff. You look around at, in the stores and you see all this hardware that's available. In fact, even on our own X-T3 demo movie, uh, which was a full-blown Hollywood production, we threw the kitchen sink at those cameras and we did all kinds of stuff because that's what the crew needed. But you, your basic person who just wants to make some movies, um, like I said, maybe a documentary or maybe it's family stuff or you have a business and you want to do blogging, all you really need is a camera with a lens, a camera with a lens. That is your basic in terms of hardware. You really do not need anything else. However, when you get down to all the uh, bells and whistles of uh, what's going on inside your camera, that's when things start to get a little bit murky. We have all these different specifications, you know, and you uh, go into the menus of the camera and you start looking at pages and pages of options and you start saying, what is all this stuff and how do I understand it? The first thing we're going to talk about is resolution. So just as in still photography, there is resolution in video, which is basically the number of pixels. Um, now, we typically tend to talk about the vertical dimension. So how many pixels from top to bottom of the, of the sensor are being actually output. Now, many cameras, including like our Fuji X-T3, actually record all the pixels on the camera at once and then use software to downsample it inside the camera to the correct number of pixels for your recording settings. Okay, But some cameras don't. Some cameras will actually just take a box out of the sensor or they will skip some pixels to create the correct output. But nonetheless, all things being the same, more resolution is better. However, just like in still photography, more resolution also means a bigger file. So you may not always need that. So standard def is basically kind of gone. The only time you see it is in old TV shows, or you do see it some, sometimes on web content. Um, everything went to HD many, many years ago, and there's two flavors of HD. Yes, HD stands for high def, high definition. There's 720p, which is 720 pixels vertically, and there's 1080p, which is 1080 pixels vertically. Again, notice I said vertically, because a funny thing happens when we start talking about 4K. And I'm not exactly sure why that is, but in the industry, when we talk about 4K, and there's two flavors of 4K, we tend to talk about the horizontal pixels. So there's either 3840, or 4096. So the 4096 is called Cinema 4K or a DCI 4K. And it's a slightly longer aspect ratio than ultra high def, which is the 3840. Because it's the same number of pixels vertically, but there's more of them horizontally, therefore it's actually a 17 by nine picture instead of a 16 by nine picture. Now you should know, any consumer TV that you go out and buy today on the market at any of those big box stores is a UHD TV, ultra high def. Uh, I am not aware of any TV on the market right now that is actually DCI Cinema 4K. That is something that the movie industry uses um, and some of the large streaming services originate in DCI 4K and then downsample it to uh, UHD. What are the advantages of 4K? Well, there's a higher level of sharpness. Now, again, sharpness has a lot to do with optics and not really uh, pixel resolution, but we perceive it as sharpness. Also, having more pixels can help you uh, if you are outputting in HD and not in 4K because let's say you actually want a slightly tighter shot 
than what you actually did with your lens when you captured the picture in the first place. So in software, you can zoom in on the picture and reframe it. You can move it around. Now, if you're outputting in 4K and shooting in 4K, you really can't do that without losing some of that resolution and some of that sharpness. But going 4K input to an HD output, this gives you some flexibility. So it's kind of cool to have. So what are the downsides? Well, again, it does mean bigger file sizes. And I mean a lot, lot, lot bigger file sizes. So that means you're going to need bigger, faster memory cards for your camera. You're going to need more storage when you get back home to do your editing. You're going to need a more powerful, faster computer. So consider all that in mind. And the other thing is, again, like I said, on the output side, you really have to ask yourself, is the viewer actually seeing 4K? So first of all, do you know that if you take the math on HD, it only comes out to be just over 2 megapixels? Yeah, everybody in still photography wants more and more megapixels, 16, 20, 30, 40, 50 megapixels. And that's because you're looking at a still image and you walk right up to that still print hanging on a wall and you look at it real close, so you want more sharpness. But in video with your TV, you're typically sitting like 10 feet away. You're not walking up to the screen, so you don't really need all that definition. And right now, most of us are watching this right here on HD or even lower resolution, probably on a laptop screen. So do you even need 4K? Uh, the other thing is a lot of websites just downsample. You may send it a 4K file, but what actually gets shown on a website will not be 4K at all. So be aware of the trade-offs. The number of frames per second in video uh, has a lot to do with how the output feels. Okay, Now you can do high frame rate bursts in your camera. So our Fujifilm X-T3 camera will actually go up to 30 frames a second and that's in still shooting. So what's the difference between the still shooting at 30 frames a second and video shooting at 30 frames a second? Well, it's how the output is put into a container at the end that is playable over time without interruption. So when I shoot video at 24 frames a second or 30 frames a second, the camera is putting all of that into a container that can be read as a stream of pictures, a constant stream of pictures. I can do it one frame at a time and then drop it into an editor and make a movie file out of it as well. And that's what interval time shooting does. You know time-lapse photography? Well that is a still frame, a still frame, a still frame, a still frame shot over the course of many, many hours and then it's thrown into a 10 or 20 seconds worth of video. You make a video file out of it in the editor, in the software. Where it's, what gets to be really interesting is that you can shoot something at a high frame rate, like 60 frames a second, 120 frames a second, but you can play it back at a lower frame rate, like 30 frames a second or 24 frames a second. And what that has the cool effect of is stretching out the time. So if you take the quick math example of 120 frames per second capture and play back at 30 frames per second, well, that's a quarter of the speed. So everything plays back 25% slower than it really happens. So that's how you get slow motion effects. And slow motion effects you see all the time now in commercials, and in particular you see it in nature documentaries, like high frame rate stuff of a hummingbird hovering in front of a flower, and you can see the wings flapping and, and all that. So that's done at like 10,000 frames a second, but we play it back at 24. Now one thing you need to be aware of is the standard 24 FPS that we use in movie making uh, actually comes in two different flavors. There's the real 24.000 frames per second, which was the standard frame rate when we were shooting film, okay? But the standard rate in digital cinema is 2398. So why you need to know this is if you have two cameras, you need to make sure both of them are either set to 24 or both of them are set to 2398. Because if they're set at different frame rates, when you go to play them back, you're going to get a mismatch between them. And in particular, this happens with dialogue. So what can happen is you can get a lip sync problem, and you don't want a lip sync problem. 
The other thing that's going to matter is if you're using a second sound recorder, okay, external sound, the microphone going to a second sound device, the sound recordist is going to set a frame rate on their device to record the sound at a certain frame rate. And you need to make sure the camera matches the sound recording frame rate again, or you will have a lip sync problem. As you know, in still photography, there is compression. Typically, you know it's something called JPEG, okay? And sometimes you know it's something called TIFF. Compression, first of all, in life is a really good thing. Compression is all around us. We couldn't survive in our modern day and age without it. All the music you listen to on streaming services is compressed. All the video you watch, all the movies you watch over the various streaming services is compressed. DVDs, you remember DVDs? Most people don't have them anymore, but those are highly compressed. And if you were to pause on a frame of DVD and just go up and look at the screen, you would see all kinds of blocks and squares and squiggly lines and artifacts. And that's because of the compression. But like I said, compression makes life bearable. So it's not a bad thing. So the thing about compression in video is there is many different kinds of compression happening all at the same time. And that's not like it is in still photography. We typically have only one kind of compression or none at all if you're shooting raw. Now there is raw video, okay? But basically nobody uses that except for big top end uh, feature film production. In fact, almost all television broadcast uh, production being done is being done in some kind of a compressed format, not raw. So don't get all worried about, I have to have raw video. No, you don't, and you don't want raw video, okay? It's too much to deal with. Now, just like in still photography, there is bit depth, and bit depth does matter, but you don't have to get all excited about saying, I've got to have 16 bit. No, you don't. You don't have to have 16, you don't have to have 14, you don't have to have 12. Yes, more is better, just like resolution, but it isn't essential. 8-bit, just like in still photography, has been around for a long time, and almost all of you consumer pictures that you're shooting or what you're doing in your phone is 8-bit, and you're pretty happy with that. So 8-bit video is not evil, okay? It's not. The difference is 10-bit, or 12 or 14, gives you more room to manipulate the image in post should you choose to make uh, some big moves. And note I said big moves, because you can make small changes in uh, color temperature. You can make small changes in exposure compensation without hurting the picture one bit or another in 8-bit. The trick is to get it captured right in the first place. Now, if you're really sloppy with exposure, okay, well then you really should be looking at 10-bit, 12-bit, 14, because you're gonna be doing a lot of correction in post-production. But if you get it anywhere close, 8-bit is good. The difference between 8-bit, 10-bit, or something like that is the number of steps between our shadows and our highlights, okay, from total black to total white. So in 8-bit, there's only 256 levels of increments. In 10-bit, it's 1,024, 0 to 1023 steps. So because there's more increment, each increment is smaller and finer, which means when you make adjustments, all right, the jumps can happen in smaller and smaller steps, and you don't get something known as banding. Banding is a bad, ugly thing, and I'm sure you've seen it. So this I'm showing you right now is an obvious example of the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit is just for exaggeration. But you can definitely get it in, to, in your video files if you start pushing things too much. But again, usually you're only going to do this if your exposure is totally whacked out. A uh, common place you will see this though, however, is at sunsets. Uh, when the sun is right on the horizon and you're shooting a wide shot and you've got a beach and you've got somebody standing in front, the sun, and then the, where the sky starts to go dark, because there's such a huge jump in tonality between the area of where the sun is and the upper edge of the frame where the sky is, you can almost always will see banding there if you're only at 8-bit. But again, it may or may not be a problem for you. Now, you may have heard the term codec. Codec is a shortened version of compression, decompression. And codecs exist in still photography. Uh, JPEG is a kind of a codec, all right? 
Uh, now, in video, there are many more different kinds of varieties of them. There's MP3, there's MP4, there's H.264, H.265. All these are, is these are different mathematical things uh, that take the big original video RAW file and then cram it down into a usable uh, format that can be handled by a uh, consumer level processor and then can go into a consumer level storage card. So uh, the codec is a very, very hard working engine. It's the engine that's creating your video file. Professional cinema cameras do record raw video, uh, but that is almost exclusively sent to an external recorder, a big, big, big sophisticated hard drive. So you're not usually going to do that with a consumer uh, camera. You're going to record to an ex internal card. So that is almost always compressed. Um, and it comes in different flavors. So uh, on our cameras, we typically record internally in the H.264 codec. But with the X-T3, we gave an option of uh, doing H.265, which is also known as the High Efficiency Video Codec, HEVC. So what it does is for the same file size, it gives you better quality. So H.265 is a better codec than 264. However, it's very processor intensive. And when you plug that into your computer, your computer may have uh, trouble playing it back. So a lot of uh, editing softwares will take an H.265 codec and transcode it into something that it can live with more easily. Uh, so that means it's going to turn it into a different compressed format, something uh, like ProRes uh, or uh, DNX HD, something like that. So H.264, H.265 are what are known as group of picture type of compression. Uh, this is a string of many, many frames put together that relate to each other. Now the external output via the HDMI on the Fuji X-Series cameras uh, is called uncompressed. Now that's not, that doesn't mean there isn't any kind of compression, but it refers to the fact that there is no codec being applied. So on the uh, X-T3, for example, it is 10-bit external as opposed to 8-bit. So, but the, the fact that it's not like full 16-bit from the capture of the sensor means there is some kind of compression going on, but there's no codec, and therefore it's called uncompressed. The codec gets applied to the recorder that you attach to the camera. So as I mentioned, there's the group of pictures, GOP, but there's also something called all I or all intra. And all intra is much better quality, and uh, the software and your editor is going to be happier using it. The way all I works is every single frame, so you shoot a string of 24 frames in one second, every single one of those 24 frames is individually compressed as if it was a standalone JPEG. I didn't say it was JPEG. I said it's like JPEG because I want you to understand. Every frame is compressed on its own, which means you could extract that one frame just by itself and look at it, and it will have the maximum amount of image quality. Group of pictures doesn't work like that. Group of pictures is the first frame in the string of 15 or 30 frames is the iframe. So that gets the full treatment. That gets the best, highest level of compression. That's the best picture. And then the frames that come after that are actually more like text data. There's very little image data in those frames. But it's data that refers back to frame number one. So you need frame number one, and you need all the other frames to talk to each other in order to make sense of that whole string. If that string is broken, you have a problem. You can't play back any of those frames inside that string. So that's the bad side of it. The good side of it is it's a lot less data, so GOP gives you much more smaller files. But again, you can record an all intra in the camera and bypass that step altogether and just have higher quality to begin with. The next kind of compression that you're going to uh, encounter with video is known as color compression or color subsampling. This relies on the fact of our human vision that we are more sensitive to brightness values than we are to changes in color. 
So color subsampling takes advantage of our inability to differentiate fine little, little subtle changes in color and we actually can throw some of the color information away in the video signal but we always retain all the brightness value because that's what our eye is most sensitive to. So by throwing away some of the color info we get a smaller file and this is good. Your capture in the camera is always going to start as the full RGB uh, picture data for every pixel. But then what happens when we turn it into video is we go to YCC, also known as YUV, where the Y is the brightness values, and then the CC or the UV are known as color difference signals. And there's only two color difference signals, and we extract the third color by looking at what the difference is between them. So that's where the chroma subsampling data values come from a 444, 422, 420. Um, so you'll notice the first column refers to the Y, the brightness, and then the second two refer to the two color difference signals. So in 422 is we keep all the luminance value, but we throw away half of the color information. It's really super good. Again, super high-end movie stuff is 444. 422 is you know, pretty much more than what you even see on TV broadcast because most of what comes out of a broadcast is still down to 420. So uh, it's again, it's a quarter of the amount of data as 444 in terms of color information, but you don't really notice it. Now, uh, the cameras like the X-T3 record uh, 420 to the SD card but the external HDMI is 422. The internal is really, really good. You don't have to worry about it, but if you are going to be doing a lot of post-production, okay, and in particular with its blue screen, green screen special effects, then capture in 422, because 422 gives you more malleability in post-production than 420, because there's more color value information to start with. All right, so I've talked about all these things working together at the same time, right? So eventually it adds up to what is known as the data rate. So the bit rate is not the same as the bit depth, okay? So think of it as uh, you have a big giant fire hose or you have a small garden hose and how much water is able to come down that pipe. Uh, you can set this in the camera. It can be anywhere from 50 to 100, 200, 400 megabits per second. And the higher the number, the more information coming down that pipe. Again, more is better, but it's not always necessary. When are you going to need more? You're going to need more when you have a lot of action, a lot of activity. So sports, something like 200, 400 megabit per second is really where you want to be. Um, Let's say you're shooting uh, leaves blowing in the wind or a field of wheat blowing in the wind. Well, you're so much detail in that picture and it's moving at a high rate of speed, you should go to a higher bit rate than a lower bit rate if you don't want to see artifacts. You'll see artifacts in all those strands of wheat. Things will start looking glitchy and ugly. So uh, choose uh, more if you need it. Again, choose lower, say 50 megabit per second. Just like me talking, there's not a lot changing in the frame. So honestly, you could do 50 or 30 megabits per second if you're doing just a basic interview because there isn't much really changing in the frame. This is a quick snapshot here of what the video specs are on the Fuji X-T3 camera. So we can do up to 60 frames per second in 4 to 2 10-bit in full DCI Cinema 4K 4096 resolution. That's really, really good. And then you see the numbers change as we drop down into HD or the high speed 120 frames a second, which is HD only, not 4K. Another thing I'm sure you've heard about is something called log, and you will see this in the uh, X-H1 and the X-T2, the X-T3 camera. No, not this kind of log talking about log video, which stands for logarithmic. So logarithmic is an encoding. What it does is it spreads the data out, 
differently than linear encoding, which is standard uh, video that you see uh, and the way it's displayed, okay, on your TV set. But our eyes react differently to shadows than we do to highlights. And what logarithmic does is it tries to duplicate that and it allocates you know, your range from shadow to highlight in a stretched out way that gives you a lot more dynamic range. The thing to know about log is it's not meant to be viewed. It is a capture medium, okay? It's meant to be temporary. It's supposed to go into software and color, get color corrected. By itself, log looks terrible. This is me being recorded in F-Log, Fuji Log. So you'll see it's really flat, not very pretty. All the colors are washed out. My skin looks kind of dead. This is not what you want to give to your client. However, it gives me lots of room to manipulate. So I can apply all kinds of color corrections. I can do stuff to it. And I can simply put a lookup table on this uh, in the post to convert it from log to Eterna where it looks really great. If you shoot a wedding in log and you give the bride the final uh, your final edit in log, I guarantee you will not get paid, okay? So um, keep that in mind. Use it. It's great, but not if you're not into color correcting. If you don't understand color correcting, do not shoot log uh, because you're going to hate it. There's color spaces in video, just like there's color spaces in still photography. In a video these days, the most common one is something known as Rec. 709, and that has been around since HD came out. Uh, that is what everything on your current displays looks like, and all cameras basically shoot inside the Rec. 709 color space. But then along came Ultra High Def, and a new spec was created, a new color space called Rec. 2020, which is much, much bigger than Rec. 709. Again, now here, bigger is better. And with color, just like shooting in Adobe versus sRGB, it's probably a good practice to shoot with more color uh, and then convert it down later because uh, you're capturing more and then you can uh, throw away what you don't need. So just so you know, uh, the F-Log in the, the Fuji cameras is in Rec. 2020 color space. So when you go to post-production, uh, you can edit in color 2020 or you can use what's called a lookup table to convert it to Rec. 709 to make it look more normal. Now when you do shoot in the Rec. 709 color spaces on the Fuji cameras, you're really lucky because of our color science based on decades and decades worth of filmmaking. Uh, we have film simulations, and these are really very, very accurate mathematical representations of different film stocks. The one we're probably most proud of is the one called Eterna. Now, Eterna was the Fujifilm brand name for motion picture color negative film. Uh, the stuff is just gorgeously beautiful. And you can set your camera to shoot in Eterna color space. And that is what I'm using right now in the Fuji X-T3. I am recording this in Eterna color space, and I'm, I hope you like what you're seeing. It basically it gives you a filmic look without having to do any kind of post-production whatsoever. Uh, it's one of the advantages of having a, a Fuji camera. So the last thing I'm going to touch on is something known as high dynamic range, which you probably heard about. This is important because when you go out to a big box store to shop for a TV now, uh, pretty much every TV on the market now is being sold to you as being HDR capable. Now, a lot of people in Hollywood and the filmmaking world believe that high dynamic range is actually more important than 4K resolution. And the reason for that is it's a totally different way of seeing the picture. The important thing you need to know is HDR in video is completely different than HDR in still photography. In still photography, you shoot multiple exposures. You do underexpose and you overexpose, and you go into software and you stack those exposures together, the purpose of which is to create a file that fits into a print medium of a limited amount of tonality. You're going to make a print so you're tricking the file, you're remapping the tonal values to fit into uh, a limited display space. With video HDR, it's kind of the opposite. But what they did with HDR when they invented it was they said, hey, we're going to change the display. The display is actually capable of way, way more brightness, 10 times 
even, you know, almost a hundred times more brightness than what you're currently used to seeing. So it's a display thing. It's really not a capture thing. Any camera now that shoots log already has enough dynamic range to be HDR capable. So uh, you already have it in the camera, so you don't have to worry. The thing is, this is something that usually gets applied in post. You don't do it in the camera. You shoot log, you give it to the post-production house, and they will worry about creating the different kinds of HDR. So that's it. Uh, I thank you for joining me. I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, feel free to explore your menus in, de in depth. Do a lot of reading online about video technology. Uh, this is Michael Wilbenko from Fujifilm. Thanks for joining me.